Okay, everybody, here's the recorded lecture I promised you all, covering uh, Jacob chapters 4 through 6. And in, re in, in reality, we're going to be essentially focusing on Jacob chapter 5 and the allegory of the olive tree, um, which was um, an allegory written originally by a prophet named Zenos, and Jacob quotes Zenos quite a bit. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of parts where it's hard to know if he's quoting directly or summarizing what Zenos said, but we won't worry too much about that distinction. Um, it's worth uh, pointing out why Jacob is presenting the allegory of the olive tree. In Jacob chapter 4, where Jacob is writing, he's trying to explain how it's true that the Jews in Jerusalem could reject Christ and then later accept him. And he says that it's actually a long story, and the explanation um, requires unfolding the allegory of the olive tree presented by Zenos. And so that's why this is here. He's, he's sort of laying out essentially Israel's future in terms of rejecting and then accepting Christ again. And the allegory of the olive tree is a beautiful way to present it. Um, the, uh, the allegory comes in essentially three major sections, and we'll, we'll relate them all together. But the basic premise, right, that you remember reading is that in this allegory, there's a lord of the vineyard and then a key servant who serves with him. And the two of them are trying to produce olives from the olive trees uh, in the vineyard. And in fact, there's one in particular, a, an especially precious olive tree to the Lord of the vineyard. That's the center of attention throughout this allegory. Um, verses 3 through 14 with this allegory essentially describe the first scattering of Israel, roughly covering a, a long period. Um, 720 BC to about 70 AD. Um, and this is setting the stage. Essentially what's happened is the Lord of Vineyard has come across this olive tree and he's noticed that it's starting to perish. And he's trying to decide what to do with this olive tree that's going to die. He doesn't want it to die. And so he comes up with a plan to manage that. Um, it, that plan involves taking the olive tree and scattering it um, to various parts of his vineyard, which you guys remember from your reading. This is a reflection of the scattering of Israel, which happened over multiple decades from the time that the ten tribes were, were attacked and, and became the lost ten tribes up through the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, but all this period essentially talks about the various ways that the children of Israel, who were once a chosen and precious people, would be scattered around the earth. Um, and so essentially that's what the Lord of the Vineyard does. Um, one thing to notice is that, it, and this helps place this allegory into historical context, is that each time the Lord of the Vineyard visits the vineyard, it roughly corresponds with the historical appearance of the Savior on earth. And in fact, this first period in the allegory relates to the mortal ministry of Christ. Um, if you read verses 15 through 18, the, so after the scattering has occurred, if you look at verses 15 through 18, it, it, it corresponds pretty closely with the appearance of the Lord in his mortal ministry. And so, for example, um, in these verses, oh, and by the way, I should say throughout, you can pause this video at any point and read the verses that I'm referencing so you can see it in context. I'm not going to pause in the video and I'm not going to take time to read the verses. But uh, the nice thing about having this as a video is you guys can pause the video whenever you want. So in verses 15 through 18, you'll notice the Lord of the Vineyard now wants to go down to see what's happened because of the scattering. He sent the, he, he sent the, um, the various branches of the olive tree and, and grafted it into other trees in various parts of the, in various parts of the vineyard, um, which in this place, in this case represents the world. And now he's coming back in to investigate and to see what's going on. And so in verses 15 through 18, um, what you see is that the Lord has come back to the original tree, the one he was worried about. Um, and he sees that the wild olive branches have been grafted in. And in this case, they, they uh, sprung forth and began to bear fruit. Uh, this is the gospel being preached following immediately following Christ's ministry. This is the gospel being preached to the Gentiles. This is Paul's ministry, essentially, in preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And he's taken these wild branches that is not, not 
members of the of the house of Israel, the Gentiles, and he's grafted them in into Jerusalem, which are this original tree. This is essentially through the preaching of the gospel by the apostles to the Gentiles. And there's some good fruit that's starting to come out of it. They're accepting the gospel. And so the tree that uh, the original tree is actually fruitful because of the Gentiles, and that reflects what happens what happened historically. Verses 19 through 24 is the chance for the Lord of the Vineyard to go and investigate the different scattered branches. And uh, in these verses, you'll notice that there are three scattered branches planted in poor ground that sought to that that, that brought forth good fruit. Um, I think it's important to note that these were these were planted in poor ground, not good ground. The, these three scattered branches that are being referenced in Jacob 5 are not a reference to um, the Nephites. We're going to get to that one in just a bit. Instead, these represent three other groups of people, that uh, three branches of Israel that were scattered around. And, and in all likelihood, based on the historical accuracy of this allegory, these are probably three groups of, of Israelites that we don't know about yet, whose records we essentially don't have. Um, now, whether or not the number is three or that it's just a symbolic three, who knows? My personal theory, and this is in no means doctrine, is I think there are at least three more groups that wrote a historical record about their understanding of the Savior and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I think we'll have those someday. The idea that there are more records out there is not um, a secret. In fact, Christ told that to the Nephites when he came after his resurrection. And so there are more people, there, there have been more righteous branches of Israel scattered around the earth, more records to come. We just don't have them yet, which is something really exciting to think about when you think of how important the Book of Mormon is in our lives. And to think that there's even more for us to come to know is pretty precious and exciting. So each of those three branches that were taken to the poor spots of the vineyard, um, they all three bore fruit, which was great. Uh, in verses 25 through 28, we get the account of the Nephites. And uh, what you essentially see is that this is a branch that was planted in, in good ground. In fact, one of the best parts of the entire vineyard. And uh, if you'll notice that only part of the tree brought forth good fruit, the other part brought forth wild fruit or bitter fruit, and, uh, and that roughly represents the fact that, you know, half of Lehi's descendants were righteous and faithful, the Nephites, and the other half were not. Those are the Lamanites, and that's, the rep that's what that represents. So um, the Lord of the Vineyard at this point says to, 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 to pluck off all the branches of the Nephites, or, or sorry, of Lehi's descendants, pluck off all the bad branches and throw them in the fire. And that represents what happened at Christ's coming um, to the Nephites, how the wicked were destroyed and, and, and then the righteous remained. And so, um, so, so the Lord of the vineyard and his servant nourish it, and then a long time again passes away. And that brings us to the restoration of the gospel. So at this point, the Lord comes again. Historically, this represent his, represents his appearance to Joseph Smith. But... Uh, but here, the, uh, the, the Lord of the Vineyard um, is now setting up for the restoration of the gospel. And so the main tree in Jerusalem, which is described in verses 29 through 37, um, the, the fruits of this tree now are, is a great variety of fruit, none of which is good. So it's all different kinds of fruit on this original tree. But none of that fruit is good anymore. And this is a symbol representing the apostasy and how out of the apostasy sprung all these different beliefs about God and Jesus Christ and how from all of these different beliefs, none of them truly represent the restored gospel. None of them represent accurately the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's why you have all this variety of fruit, but none of which is good. It essentially represents the myriad beliefs uh, about God and Jesus Christ that don't reflect the truth about him. Um, and so none of these Christian religions descended that descended from the ancient church, none of these are divine. Verses 38 through 40 takes us to those, takes us to those scattered branches, the ones um, that were planted in poor ground. And what you see in those is that all three of them have become bad. They've all become corrupt. 
from the first to the to the third and uh and the lord of the vineyard is sad because all of these trees are now gone and the wild fruit has taken over verses 42 through 46 are particularly about the nephites and uh and, and what you see here is that uh, again the entire fruit has become corrupted all of it is gone um and uh, in fact the lord laments the fact that this was this last one was planted in the best ground he had the best spot of ground in his entire vineyard and yet that one was bad um it, or it had gone bad and so this this description when the lord comes again that is to say the restoration when he came uh, to talk to jesus christ allegorically here in, in in the parable of the of the of the olive tree the Lord has come back and he's found all nothing but corruption essentially he's found that uh, none of these efforts have are, are now yielding fruit they've they've all been overcome and that represents the the, the effect of the apostasy on the earth um, these are interesting verses in particular because and what amazes me is how detailed this allegory is and I want you to remember the context of this this is a, an allegory by a prophet an Old Testament prophet named Zenos being recounted now by Jacob um, this is important because Jacob is laying out and Z through Zenos they're, they're, they're laying out essentially the history of the earth to come and also it turns out a history that's been but one that Jacob didn't know about if you, if you pause for a minute and read verse 44, you'll notice that in that verse there's a reference to how the tree that was planted in the best spot of the vineyard, that is to say the Nephites, that tree is occupying a spot that had been cumbered by another tree before. In verse 44, the Lord of the vineyard says, that behold us that I also cut down that which cumbered this spot of ground, that I meant that I might plant this tree in the stead thereof. So he's saying he put the Nephites into the promised land after having cut off another group of people that were already there. This is a reference to the Jaredites. Um, the Jaredites were cut off because they had all become wicked and the Lord brought in Lehi and his family to take their place. Now this is a really interesting and important observation because Jacob didn't know about the Jaredites at the time that he was relating the prophecy of Zenos here. So Zenos, in his prophecy, clearly made reference to the Jaredites. Jacob quoted that reference to the Jaredites, not knowing at the time that, the, that it specifically referenced the Jaredites. The Nephites wouldn't yet discover the existence of the Jaredites for, for, for a while yet, and uh, for a couple hundred years, actually. And so this is, this is a really fascinating and important reference um, because it shows the, the historical detail of it of the allegory of the olive tree you know it's it's good to pause here and call attention to verses 41 and then 47 through 48 and 41 the lord says it, it, the, the verse says it came to pass that the lord of the vineyard wept and said unto the servant what could i have done more for my vineyard and skipping ahead to 47 but what could i have done more in my vineyard have i slackened my hand that i have not nourished it Nay, I have nourished it, and I have digged about it, and I have pruned it, and I have dunged it, and I have stretched forth mine hand almost all the day long. And the end draweth nigh, and it grieveth me that I should hew down all the trees of my vineyard and cast them into the fire that they should be burned. Who is it that has corrupted my vineyard? It's really interesting that he asked the question about who corrupted his vineyard. That is to say, this wasn't just a natural process. The Lord of the vineyard had done all he could to to make his vineyard fruitful and yet it became corrupted and he specifically references that it that it was corrupted by people not just by natural circumstances and this is where the lord it, this is where the lord's servant replies and he says is it not the loftiness of thy vineyard a reference to pride have not the branches thereof overcome the roots which are good and because the branches have overcome the roots thereof, behold, they grew faster than the strength of the roots, taking strength unto themselves. Behold, I say, is not this the cause that, thy trees, that the trees of thy vineyard have become corrupted? It will be important to understand what the roots symbolize versus the branches. The branches are the living descendants of Israel at the time, um, at this point the allegory. The roots are a reference to spiritual heritage. They're a reference to the scriptures and the prophets and the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
And because of pride, Israel has rejected those things and and has has tried to go on without them, essentially. That is to say, growing without or, or growing faster than the strength of the roots. And because of the pride of of the living descendants of Israel, um, they fell into apostasy. And and this was a choice. And, and really the answer to the question about who is a reference to the adversary, it's a, it's a reference to Satan who has led the children of Israel into apostasy. So 49 through 47 reference the restoration and the gathering of Israel that comes as a result of, of Jesus Christ appearing to Joseph Smith and restoring the gospel. In fact, the servant is the one who begs the Lord of the vineyard to spare it a little longer. And the servant throughout this parable is a reference to those prophets who have been called to serve and represent Jesus Christ. And the servant is, like many prophets before, is pleading for the people on behalf of the people that the Lord will show them mercy. And the Lord says, Yea, I will spare it a little longer in verse 51, because he doesn't want to lose the trees of his vineyard. And this is when the gathering occurs. And starting in verse 52, the Lord describes a process by which those branches that were scattered to the northern parts of the vineyard where the poor ground were, the branches that were scattered to the favored parts, specifically to the Nephites, all of those scattered branches are not going to be gathered back into the original tree. And, and he's going to slowly, bit by bit, gather in the, the branches to the natural tree and bit by bit cutting off the parts of the original tree that are not bearing fruit until finally all have been grafted together and uh, and, he, and he does that knowing that it will bear good fruit again. And he says in verse 60, Because I have preserved the natural branches and the roots thereof, and that I have grafted in the natural branches again into their mother tree, again describing the gathering of Israel, and I preserved the roots of their mother tree, these promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that perhaps the, that perhaps the trees in my vineyard may bring forth again good fruit that I may have joy again in the fruit of my vineyard, and perhaps that I may rejoice exceedingly that I have preserved the roots and the branches of the first fruit. Again, all references to the original promises made to Israel. So he tells his servant, go and call other servants, and we're going to labor diligently to make this plan happen. And in verse 62, wherefore let us go and labor with our might this last time. For behold, the end draweth nigh, and this is for the last time that I shall prune my vineyard. We are in the middle of that process right now. Historically, this is where we fit in the allegory. We are those servants that have been called by the original servant to help in the gathering of Israel, to do the work of, of pruning the Lord's vineyard, grafting in the branches that have been scattered around the vineyard, digging about the trees, both old and young, and nourishing them all again this one last time. And that's our responsibility. And as, as these things happen, the old branches are cleared away, cleared away and the new ones, and, and the, the, the original ones are restored. And, uh, and um, the, in that, the, the gathering of Israel is represented by that bringing of all the original branches back to the tree. So we just reference those verses in 61 and 62. And uh, 70 through 74 reference that process where the servants go and do everything that the Lord has, has, has laid out in his plan. I love 72 because it came to pass that the servants did go and labor with their mites and the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. And that is the truth and the promise of our, of our work is that Christ is working with us. He is at our side in, in a very real way, helping us accomplish these purposes. And in laboring with all diligence, you'll see in verse 74 um, that, uh, let's see, I'm going to start in the middle. They became like unto one body. Sorry, the, the trees had become again the natural fruit. And they became like unto one body, and the fruits were equal. And the Lord of the vineyard had preserved unto himself the natural fruit, which was most precious unto him from the beginning. This is what he wanted. He wanted us. We are the fruit. Um, I realize I just said we're the servants, but, as, but, our, but the other place we have in this allegory is that we are the fruit. We're the good fruit that the Lord wants. He wants us. 
And I love what he says to his servants in the middle of verse 75. Blessed art thou, for because ye have been diligent in laboring with me in my vineyard, and have kept my commandments, and have brought unto me again the natural fruit, that my vineyard is no more corrupted, and the bad is cast away, behold, ye shall have joy with me because of the fruit of my vineyard. And essentially, 75 through 77 describe the millennium, that last appearance of the, of the Lord, where he says in verse 76, Behold, for a long time will I lay up the fruit of my vineyard unto mine own self against the season, which speedily cometh. And for the last time I have nourished my vineyard and pruned it and dug about it and dunged it, therefore I will lay up unto mine own self the fruit for a long time, a reference to the length of the millennium. And then in 77, he says that when the, when the evil fruit comes again, then that's the end of the vineyard, um, and all of it will be burned with fire, and the, the earth will have accomplished its purposes for us. Um, the reason Jacob is relating this to his people and to us is because he wants us to understand our place in this grand plan of saving souls. I love what Jacob tells his people um, in the next chapter, in, in chapter seven, in chapter six, verse seven. In that verse, he's he's talking to his people, and he's also talking to us. And he says, "For behold, after ye have been nourished by the good word of God all the day long, just like the Lord had described so effusively, in in chapter five, saying, I, 'I've dunged it, I've pruned it, I've dug about it, I've done, every, I've nourished it in every way I can.'" This is what the Lord is doing for us to try to save us. And Jacob is reminding his people and us of this exact thing. He says, after you've been nourished by the good word of God all the day long, will ye bring forth evil fruit? That's the question for us. How are we going to respond? Are we going to bring forth good fruit or evil fruit? Because this is our place in all of this. And so that's the end of it. That's, um, I hope useful to you and instructive to you and I look forward to seeing you guys next time.